Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity to reflect upon your word, to learn from you as you teach our hearts. We thank you for, Father, the, the privilege of corporate gathered believers who can open up your word and to just behold the greatness of who you are. And so I pray that you would do that amongst us this morning, individually, as families, and then as a church family, that you would open up our spiritual eyes to see wonderful things from your word. Father, I pray that we would deeply reflect upon these truths so that we would be doers of your word and not merely hearers who are self-deceived. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, open your Bibles, brethren, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And if you're able to stand with me, please do so for the reading of God's Word, in honor of God's Word. I want to read Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20, just to get the whole context before us again, though we're going to be zeroing in on Philippians 4, 14 through 20 this morning. And never forget that this is God's authoritative, inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. Amen? Philippians 4 and verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have in abundance. I am amply supplied having received from Epaphroditus, which you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want you to keep your finger in Philippians chapter 4, and go with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is one of the most sobering passages that you'll read in God's Word. It's found in this particular section, Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. And the sobriety of it is brought about by someone in the crowd, as Jesus is teaching the crowds, with a request Luke 12, verse 13, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. So this guy is demanding that Jesus get involved in matters of a civil dispute. That's the request. Jesus answers in verse 14, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? And now here's the master teacher. Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And now here's the object lesson. He told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. So think of the scenario here. Here's a man who is very prosperous, most likely a farmer, right, a landowner. And this guy, as he is becoming more and more uh, fruitful as far as the productivity of his land goes, instead of sharing, instead of giving, instead of investing into others, maybe allowing the poor to glean even more from the fruit of his labors and all of that, says, I'm going to make bigger barns and build larger storage units so that I'm going to be able to essentially hoard this stuff. This is your classic hoarder here. And then verse 19, and I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, 
drink, and be merry. In other words, he says, I'm going to live a worry-free life. Comfortable, ease, right? Take no massive risks. In other words, I'm going to live a normal life. We might say that there's a lot of people in America who have this mentality. I'm just going to live a normal life. Because it's all about eating, drinking, being merry, right? For tomorrow we die. That's his attitude. Don't miss this. Verse 20. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? What's the answer? Someone else will, right? He cannot take that with him at all. And here's the punchline in verse 21. So is the man or woman who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What a sobering passage. The Lord Jesus is instructing on the dangers of covetousness and greed here. This man was just that. He was greedy, covetous, a hoarder of possessions. And he was presumptuous, thinking that, hey, he's going to live forever to enjoy all of these things that he has. He had deceived himself into thinking that materialism and money and possessions was the key to his happiness. And Jesus says, no. And the sobering caution is given to him and obviously to all readers, including us. Elsewhere, Jesus cautions in Mark chapter 8, what will it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And of course, the answer is nothing. Right? There's nothing that we can offer God in exchange for the well-being of our soul if we rejected Jesus and instead loved possessions and loved hoarding material resources on earth. Puts money and possessions and materialism into perspective, doesn't it? Texts like these. Now, it should be said, it's important that as we look at Scripture, that money and possessions are not evil in and of themselves, are they? If God has provided that for you through hard work, praise the Lord. If God has given you a house and clothing and cars and all of that, and He's done that through hard work for His glory, praise God. The issue is not that money and possessions and resources are evil in and of themselves. The issue is, what do you do with these? How do you invest them? And is your trust and dependence on those things? Are those idols of your heart that you worship? Are those things that you elevate above God's priorities, above God's kingdom? Well, the Philippians had it right, brethren. This was a giving church, a very generous church whose priorities were right. They were a kingdom-minded, gospel-focused congregation. And they were generous in response to needs that were around them for the sake of the gospel. And this is what we want to consider this morning. We've already seen, if you think about the context, that walking worthy of Christ means that we strive to preserve unity. We saw that in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4, that walking worthy of Christ uh, means that we strive to live peacefully within and without, right? We are to be spirit-filled Christians who are joyful and gracious and God-dependent. That's in verses 4 through 7. Walking worthy of Christ means that we cultivate a Christ-like mind, and emulate Christ-like models in verses 8 and 9. Christ-like uh, walking worthy of Christ means that we cultivate heartfelt contentment. That was in verses 10 through 13 last week, that we are to be content people, that we are not to base that contentment on circumstances or on favorable relationships, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but a contentment that is rooted in our relationship with Jesus, because that never changes. All of those virtues... And all of those godly pursuits are to be the ongoing pattern of those who walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now here in verses 14 through 20, as Paul continues with his thank you note to the Philippian church, we get a glimpse into the generosity of this little church, a church that Paul founded about 10 years before, and that for all of those years, as he now pens this letter, have been faithful to Practicing generosity, not only in their giving material possessions, but just in their service and their love for one another and for other people outside of their church. And so here in this passage, as you're taking notes, I want us to 
contemplate and think about three encouraging qualities of generosity. Three encouraging qualities of generosity that we too may be people who are practicing generosity from the heart for the good of others and for God's glory, brethren, for our help. First of all, the first encouraging quality that we see here is this. Generosity is commendable. Generosity is commendable. That's in verses 14 through 16. Remember that Paul has just told them in verses 10 through 13 that God has taught him contentment. But he wants to commend them because they've done well. Nevertheless, verse 14, nevertheless, though I am content, in other words, right from the previous context, you have done well. In other words, you have done nobly. You have done the right thing. What is this noble right thing? You've done well to share with me in my affliction. There's that word koinonia again, translated here in verse 14, share, to share. They are co-fellowshippers shippers with Paul. And what, what in particular? In his affliction, right? Verse 14, in his affliction, which means in his distresses, in his difficulties, in his hour of pressure, in his hour of trouble. These people are sharers with him in his affliction. How so? They are a giving church. Knowing that his distress or his troubles, this church has come alongside of Paul to bring much needed relief on more than one occasion. They've come alongside of their aching brother in Christ. They've been with him in the good times, and they've been with him in the bad times. This is not a fair weather church, the Philippian church. This is a church that's been there through thick and thin with the Apostle Paul. In fact, back in chapter 1 and verse 5, he expresses gratitude for their participation koinonia again, their participation in the gospel. There's the key, in the gospel from the first day until now. For 10 years now, he says, I'm so thankful for you that for 10 years, you partnered with me. You've been a co-fellowshipper with me in the preaching of the gospel. And he wants them to know how much he appreciates them. He commends them. They are a gospel-focused people. Note how he expands on this gospel sharing in verse 15. You yourselves also know, Philippians, you're aware of this, that at the first preaching of the gospel, he keeps bringing this issue of the gospel up, doesn't he? Because that's the key priority and the reason for their partnership. It's all about Christ. It's not about them. And I would say that to us, brethren. In your generous giving, in your contribution of your service and of your time and whatever you give in the practice of generosity, recognize that it's about the gospel. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the progress of the name of Christ in this world. Amen? Verse 15, at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. What's this all about in verses 15 and 16? Well, Paul is reminiscing about his second missionary journey recorded in Acts chapter 16. Remember, at that time, it was about 10 years ago, from the time that Paul pens this letter of Philippians, 10 years ago, the church at Philippi was birthed in the house of a, of a little lady named Lydia. The church is birthed, and Paul, from that time, had needs, physical needs, practical needs. It's not like he had some savings account to draw from. He had needs as he's preaching the gospel, and he went from Philippi at the time to Thessalonica and then Berea, all three of those cities in the region of a, of a, a region called Macedonia, and then from the region of Macedonia, after ministering there and preaching Christ there, Paul moves on to the region of Achaia, where he also ministers in a place called Corinth, and then in a place called Athens, all strategic cities all pagan, idolatrous cities. And he's ministering the gospel there. He's preaching Christ in the midst of opposition and in the midst of pushback from the religious authorities and from the Roman government as well. I mean, it was one gospel mission after another, nonstop. And undoubtedly, he had many basic needs he and, the, and his companions lacked their basic needs as they preached the gospel. Now, let me ask you this. 
as he went from city to city and from town to town preaching Jesus, who do you think was supporting the Apostle Paul? It was this little church and some other churches in Macedonia. This little church at Philippi was God's means of provision for the Apostle Paul. Remember we saw this last week. God is sovereign, sovereign over everything, but he uses means, right, to provide for his people. He used the Philippian church and other churches in that region of Macedonia. It was them sharing with Paul in the gospel ministry. Now, normally, think about this. When we think about people who give sacrificially, what do we normally think about? We think to ourselves, well, well, of course, those people or this church gave because, you know, they were pretty well off. They must have been pretty prosperous themselves. That's why they gave. Think again. Think again. Earlier, Pastor Paul read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we read this about the churches in Macedonia, which included Philippi. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which was given or has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Listen to this. That in great ordeal of affliction, that's speaking of of their their situation. They are afflicted and, and afflicted people materially, specifically in the area of material possessions. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. Note the language used, right? Affliction, deep poverty, and yet they gave with an abundance of joy in the wealth of their liberality. It's a great paradox, right? And then he says, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability... They gave of their own accord. In other words, they gave joyfully and voluntarily, not forced or coerced or by compulsion, this church or these churches in Macedonia, begging us, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. Don't miss this. In other words, these people were chomping at the bits, brethren, to give to the Lord's work, to care for the needs of others, those who were doing gospel work. But this text tells us that the Philippians were not a super prosperous people. It's not like they had a lot to give. They were struggling just to make ends meet themselves, and yet they, as well as other churches in Macedonia, were joyful, self-sacrificial givers. And Paul says, I want to commend you. I want to thank you. I want to affirm you. And I submit to you that as Paul commends these Christians right off the bat, we learn some key principles or lessons about generosity, don't we? Number one, write these down. Number one, a heart of generous giving is rooted in a passionate desire to partner for the sake of the gospel. Isn't that what we see in what he's articulating about this Philippian church? They were passionate about partnering with Paul and his companions for the sake of the gospel. That right there is what fuels generous giving right there. It's a vision greater than yourself. That of the kingdom of Christ. Partnership for the sake of the gospel. When our sights are fixed, brethren, on God's priorities, the progress of the gospel, the kingdom of God, we're going to want to give to a greater cause than ourselves. It's not going to be about, I have to give. It's going to be about, I want to give for that cause. When our priorities are straight, and it's on the gospel and on kingdom priorities, then listen, our wallets will be in line with God's priorities. And our bank ledgers will be in line with God's priorities. Number two, a heart of generosity in giving is to be sacrificial. It's to be sacrificial. Whatever that looks like in your life. It's ultimately not about the amount that you give, but about the heartfelt sacrifice in that gift. You remember the account of the widow's might in Luke chapter 21? Remember that? Jesus is sitting there unbeknownst to the people, And all of these people are going to the temple, the court of the women, and they're putting in their hundreds and hundreds of coins into these receptacles, right, that are very loud. And people could hear these rich people are getting in there and they're throwing in all these coins and they're looking around to see who is looking at them. Wow, look at that. 
How many coins that person put in? How many coins that other person put in? They're giving out of their abundance. And then here comes this little old widow, right? Who gave the equivalent of a penny by our measure. Two small, tiny copper coins, the equivalent of a, of a penny. And Jesus says, I tell you, this lady gave far more than anyone else, right? For they gave out of their abundance. She gave everything that she had. And it's not, the point is not, you should give everything that you have for the Lord's work, right? As the false teachers tell you. That's not the point of that account at all. It's that her sacrifice and her trust was in the Lord. Amen? That's the point. Others gave out of their abundance. She's giving sacrificially. Trusting in the Lord for His provision. That the Lord will provide for her needs. So she gives everything. Number three, a heart of generosity and giving is to be in proportion to how God has blessed you. In proportion to how God has blessed you. It's to be proportionate. According to your ability as God has blessed you in your life. And so if you're thinking about this, for example, you would expect, you would expect a generally broke college student to give comparatively less than, for instance, you know, the person with a full-time job and a family and a house and all of that, or the retired person. You would expect that. They're able to give a lot more than the broke college student, right? But what's the point? Both are to be giving sacrificially as God has prospered them in proportion to how God has prospered them. This is the point. Number four, a heart of generosity and giving is to be joyful and voluntary. It's to be joyful and voluntary. It's not to be reluctant or drudgerous. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says that God loves a cheerful, finish it, giver. God loves a cheerful giver. It's a joy to give to the Lord's work. We get to give to the Lord's work. Amen? It's not, I have to. I guess I I need to do it because the other person did it, you know? Or I have to do it because otherwise I'm going to look bad. No, it's before the Lord. And it's a joy to give to His work. So those are some initial lessons that we glean about this generous little church. And we'll pick some more along the way, okay? More lessons. But Paul says, although I'm content, I just want to commend you because you've done right, you've done nobly in constantly partnering with me for the sake of the gospel. You've been doing that for a decade now from the time that he writes from the first day until now. I want to commend you for your generosity. Brethren, we need to do that this morning. We need to do that this morning. It's fitting and it's appropriate for us as leaders that we also commend you as God's people here at East Church. I'm sure that most of you know already, but this past week, the Lord, through your generous, self-sacrificial giving, has fully provided for us to pay off the building mortgage. That's awesome, isn't it? It's okay to clap, you know? Yeah. God did that, but He did that as He moved in your hearts to give over so many years here at East Church. Thank God for you. Now we're debt-free and can do even more gospel work here in our region. Amen? That's awesome, and that's exciting. We thank God for you, and we want to commend you for your generosity in supporting the Lord's gospel work. Press on, brethren. Press on. Excel still more by the grace of God as the Lord leads you. Know that generosity is commendable. That's the first encouraging quality of generosity. Second, encouraging The second encouraging quality is this. Generosity is rewarding. Generosity is rewarding. That's in verse 17. Listen, as if it wasn't enough that God gives us the privilege of giving, He also rewards those who have an attitude of generosity and practice generosity. Look at verse 17. Paul says, Not that I seek the gift itself. Hey, not only am I content... But even the financial provision, I'm thankful for it, but it's not even about the financial provision that is my greatest joy. What is Paul's greatest joy then? Look at the text, verse 17, he says, But, on the other hand, I seek for the profit which increases to your account. I seek for your benefit. 
That word seek there is the idea of I have a strong desire for. I long for the profit which increases to your account. It's about you in the giving of resources. What's he saying? That more than the gift itself, he longs for their spiritual bank account to be full, right? That's what he's after. Their eternal account. The account that beyond the passing riches of this present world, brethren, listen, echoes into eternity. He says, I want you to be blessed. But those, that's those spiritual benefits, those spiritual blessings. One of my favorite all-time movies is the movie Gladiator. How many of you have watched that movie? So sad, you know. I'm not saying you need to go watch it, okay? But it's one of my favorite movies. I like those war movies. Gladiator. And there's this opening scene in the movie Gladiator where Russell Crowe, who's the general of this Roman uh, army, he's basically trying to pump up the Roman army to wipe out the barbarians, you know, at the time in history. And at the beginning, he says something like this, men, what we do in this life echoes into eternity. <laughs> you know, gives me some chills even thinking about it, you know. That's quite the, the moment, you know. What we do in this life echoes into eternity. Now, that's the secular world. We understand that, right? But you know what? That's true with regards to our giving. Did you know that? When you are giving unto the Lord and for His work, out of a heart of generosity, out of a heart of worship, listen, you're sending those riches into the next life. I, re- I love how Randy Alcorn puts it that way. He says, you can't take your essentially riches with you, but you can send them on ahead. I like that. You can't take your riches with you, but you can send them on ahead. Where? Into eternity. What are we talking about? We're talking about in- investing into God's eternal kingdom for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the souls of people. We're talking about what the Lord Jesus said we ought to do in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, that passage on anxiety, right? Matthew 6, 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, hey, there's a place that earth can't touch, and it's called heaven. Invest there, right? Into God's eternal kingdom and the souls of people. That's where you need to invest. See, whatever you value is what has your heart, right? Whatever you value is what has your heart and what has your pocketbook, if you will. What has your bank account, brethren? And when you're practicing generosity and investing into the kingdom of God as God's children, God promises reward. Think about this. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour out into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That right there pictures how Back in the day, if people would wear a long robe, right, and when they were buying grain, they would have to use the robe because the grain would be overflowing all over the place. They couldn't carry it all. And that's the picture, right? When you give, they will pour out into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. What's that all saying? That when you and I practice heartfelt generosity, God will lavishly provide for your needs. Not as you define your needs, but as He defines them in accordance with His Word, right? Proverbs 11.24 speaks of this issue of reward as well. There is one who scatters, that's the picture of a farmer scattering seed, right? And yet increases all the more. You would think that this farmer is losing because he's scattering all of his valuable seed, but what is he doing? He's scattering it, and then there's a watering it, and what happens? There is much fruit that comes from that. That's the picture. It pays greater dividends and profit. On the other hand, it says, there is one who withholds what is justly due. In other words, there is one who hoards what belongs to God, and yet it results only in want. You're always in need, no matter what. You withhold giving to the Lord, and you're always in need. You're not even doing the, what you should be doing at the basic level of the first fruits given to the Lord's work. He 
He says, the generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. That's Proverbs eleven twenty four and following. Second Corinthians chapter nine verse six. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. There's a talk again of reward, right? That God promises to provide for our needs when we are investing into the spiritual kingdom of the Lord. There's reward, brethren. Here's some further key lessons or principles of generous giving. Ready? We are also to give consistently. We are also to give consistently, right? I just read that text. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who scatters much, waters much, will reap the benefits of that. We are to give consistently and regularly, right? From the first fruits of what God has given us. Also, here's another one. We are to give in a calculated fashion. We are to give in a calculated manner or fashion. In other words, we are to plan to give. It should be pre-planned. It should be purposeful. It should be the top priority in our budgets every month, if you want to put it this way, practically speaking. We are to set aside of the first fruits of what God, listen to this, loans us. Because at the end of the day, guess what? Nothing that you have do you own. You are a steward of it, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. Paul instructs the Corinthians this way. He says, On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper. That's in reference to the offerings made for the needy churches. But that's a principle throughout Scripture of setting aside the best of the first fruits for God in a calculated, pre planned, purposeful fashion, right? We are to do this. And so, mark it. Generous giving is for the gospel. Generous giving is sacrificial. Generous giving is proportionate. Generous giving is joyful and voluntary. Generous giving is calculated, right? That is planned and purposeful. And generous giving is consistent and regular. That's faithfulness in the area of giving for us. And so Paul says, it's not about me. I'm so excited that God is blessing you. It gives me joy that you will be rewarded with spiritual blessings that remain beyond this life, that echo into eternity, if you will. Paul's longing and desire was for their spiritual reward. So know that generosity is commendable. Generosity is rewarding, thirdly. The third encouraging quality is this. Generosity is unto God. Generosity is unto God, verses 18 through 20. Listen, as Christians, our heartfelt generosity is ultimately for Him. It's for the glory of God. In fact, it follows that that should be the case because everything that we have, brothers and sisters, ultimately belongs to who? To God. Everything belongs to Him. Do you live mindful of that? The oxygen that you breathe, the house that you have, or the apartment that you have, the cars that you have, the bank account that you have, the retirement savings that you have, all of that belongs to God. There is nothing that you have that hasn't been given to you by God Almighty, by the great provider. Your bank account isn't yours. Your house, your cars are not yours. Ready for this? Even your own family doesn't belong to you. We all belong to God, yes? We belong to the Lord. How often do you ponder that truth and live in the light of it? So that you recognize that you are a steward of what God has given you. Everything belongs to Him. It was painful as a pastor this week even, remembering that even my books belong to the Lord. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Now that's pain right there, right? This one really hurt. My books belong to God. And everything that I have, over the years, I keep loaning out books, and then people don't return them for the most part. I hope it's none of you here at Eastridge in the last year, okay? If you have a book of mine, return it, please, okay? I might even be motivated if you do that to give it back to you as a gift. But over the years, that's what happens. But you know what? 
We need to have an attitude of, listen, this is all for the Lord. This is for His people and the service of His people. It's true. Brethren, we are stewards and managers of God's money. We are stewards and managers of God's possession. And God has graciously loaned these things to us as a test of our true heart devotion. Do you hear that? To see how we manage and invest what He's loaned us. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our generosity is unto the Lord. Paul makes this point. Look in verse 18. Verse 18. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied. In other words, I received everything that you've sent. Your messenger has arrived. The package has arrived. Everything is here. I have more than I need. I'm fully supplied. I'm fully provided for. I'm taken care of. Again, he commended them for this. But then watch this. Verse 18. Once again, it's not even about him or about the money, is it? It's about God. Verse 18, right? He says, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. Here it is. A fragrant aroma an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Oh, this is so good here. You've been reading through your Old Testament and your daily Bible reading, right? And you've read this Old Testament language here in verse 18. It's language that pictures the Old Testament sacrificial system of worship. It pictures the Old Testament worshiper bringing his spotless lamb or animal or whatever to be burned on the altar by the priest. And when that worshiper's heart was right before the Lord, the smoke from the sacrifice would rise to the sky into the very nostrils of God, and it would be a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to the Lord. It was worship unto God. It was for Him, and it was, it was well-pleasing to the Lord. Paul says, brethren, this is what your monetary gift is. This is what your offering is. It's ultimately for the Lord. Your generous gift for me and for the ministry of the gospel is a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to the Lord. It's all about Him. It's all about a heart of adoration to Him in the giving of your offering. In fact, for the Christian, all of life is this, isn't it? All of life is worship. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says that we are to present ourselves, Christians, we are to present ourselves as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to the Lord. He says it's reasonable. It's reasonable, it's logical in light of the First 11 chapters of Romans and the glories of the gospel and God saving you from your sins and saving you from hell and condemnation. He says it is reasonable and logical that in light of what God has done for you, you are to be a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to the Lord. That's the life of a believer. When you put your confident trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you die to yourself. No more demands. You're not boss of your life anymore. You don't get to decide how much I'm involved, how much I serve, how much you don't. It's all about what God wants for your life as revealed in His holy, inspired Word. Amen? That's what it's about. All of life is worship. We're a living and holy sacrifice. And when our generous giving is included in that, it is truly worship unto God from the heart. What does God promise? Look at verse 19, brethren. God promises to supply all our needs, and my God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I love the language here in verse 19. What does this mean? That God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. According to His riches. What does that mean? Well, suppose for a minute that a millionaire finds out that a person has a need. And that millionaire gives that needy person a $1 bill. That's it. You might say that that millionaire may have contributed to that person's need, but not in accordance with his vast riches, right? Not in accordance with his vast riches. Now suppose that instead of giving the needy person a $1 bill, that millionaire gives that needy person a blank check and tells that needy person to write down the full amount that they need to meet that legitimate need. 
Now, with that action, that millionaire is giving in accordance with his vast riches, isn't he? In accordance with his vast resources. And because he's got vast resources as a millionaire, he's more than able to provide fully for that person's needs. And what Paul is saying here is this. God will provide for your needs according to his riches in a manner that, is, that corresponds with his wealth. God will provide for your needs as lavishly as only God can, right? Why? Because God's riches are infinite and limitless. This is why he adds in verse 19, look at the text, verse 19, in glory, in glory, which should be translated gloriously. My God will provide for you lavishly, gloriously, in accordance with his infinite riches. That's the sense. Now listen, it's for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? And God is speaking of the present time, by the way. He's speaking of the present time that the promise is that God will fully provide for our needs as he has fully provided for Paul and for the Philippians. And as he does that, as our great God provides for us and for our needs, he is the one who deserves all of the glory. Amen? That's why he finishes with that in verse 20. Now to our God. And Father, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Literally to the ages of the ages. God deserves all of the glory. As Paul reflects upon the generosity of God through his people and how God has provided for him in his ministry and how they, even as a Philippian church, have depended upon the Lord for their provision and the other Macedonian churches, he bursts forth into a doxology toward God and he says, God is to be praised and adored forever and ever to the ages of the ages. Amen. And I love how he refers to him as father, right? He's a good and benevolent father who provides lavishly for the needs of his people. This is why he is to receive all of the glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Right? Even in the most menial and mundane activities of life, brethren, we are to do everything for the glory of God, including our stewardship before the Lord. Everything is to be done for the glory of God. As we think about this, this issue of an attitude and practice of generosity, can I ask you, would you say, honestly before the Lord, that you're characterized for having a heart of generosity? Beginning with your material possessions, but also your time, your service, right, your resources. Would you say that you are a generous person? Would you say that your priorities are fixed on the kingdom? And not on the stuff of this world so that you're a generous steward of God's resources, aiming those resources in the direction of the kingdom of God as revealed in His Word. You want to know what the greatest motivation for practicing generosity is? It's the gospel of grace, isn't it? The gospel of grace. That's why four times in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the passage that Pastor Paul read earlier, four different times it speaks of grace or favor. Grace, favor. Grace, favor right? And the expression of that is their generosity. Generosity is fueled by an understanding and application of the gospel daily to our lives, right? It's grace-fueled generosity, grace-fueled giving. And so if you're struggling in this area, that's where you need to return. You need to return to the foot of the cross and be reminded of the generosity of God in the person and the work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, in the context of generous giving, he says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, Christian, through his poverty might become rich. There's our ultimate motivation right there. The eternal Son of God came, right, though infinitely rich and majestic and glorious, possessing everything, he came to our dump earth to become a man, to die for sinners, so that when we place our confident trust in him and he saves us, we now become rich in him. Amen? We have everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's grace-fueled giving at the end of the day, brethren. It's grace-fueled generosity for the glory of God. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for your precious word and for the reminder in each of our lives and corporately of your wonderful provision 
We pray that you would help us to continue to grow in this area. Father, thank you for your people, for their generosity and their love for you and their investment into your gospel, into your kingdom. Father, there are many in our church who are so sacrificial, so focused on those priorities. For the rest of us, Lord, who are maybe needing to really grow in this area. Father, I pray that you would move in the hearts of your people to understand the gospel of grace even more and our need to make sure that we recognize that our lives doesn't, don't consist of the abundance of our possessions or of money. Help us to send those resources ahead of ourselves into eternity by investing them into the souls of people, into the gospel of grace. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.